Welcome again. In this particular talk, we're going to have a look at the project in a little bit more detail. So we'll have a look at the maybe the range of projects you might want to do and how we will structure the time that we have available within the module to, to enable you to, to develop your particular game. We'll also spend a reasonable amount of time having a look at how we will assess it, how we will determine what makes a good project and a not so good project, and also talk about how, if you like, your contribution uh, to the project and to the development gets turned into an individual mark uh, on this module. First up is a little bit of uh, advice, I suppose you could call it that, on selecting your project. So let's have a look at it. Doubtless you'll recall that uh, for this module, it is all about the project. It's a uh, you know, one and a half weighted module, uh, but there are no assessments, no assignments, there's no written exam. All of the assessment of the module is based around the project that's going to be developed. And as we talked about previously, um, I want you to pick something that you're interested in, something that you want to do, something that you will find fun, enjoyable to do, because that's um, the most likely thing then that will will keep you motivated, it'll keep you going uh, in terms of putting in the, the many hours, and it will take many hours, that it will take to, to develop the project. As we'll set out within this talk, there'll be a number of hand-in points along the way, which is really an opportunity for you to to, to show your progress and get a little bit of feedback on terms of how you are going. They're not assessed uh, in, in terms of contributing to the marks, but they are essential in, in terms of helping you shape and direct your your progress through the, the project. The final assessment um, occurs at the very end of the module, and uh, there may be a viva involved with that assessment, but I'll talk about that later on. There's three pieces of advice I could give you on developing the project. So it's not that many, but nonetheless, they're useful and they'll help you narrow in in, in what type of project you should be developing. Firstly, and certainly most importantly, develop something that you want to develop, something that you think, I'm going to enjoy doing this. Um, you've got the freedom and the flexibility really to pick any type of game and, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at different genres and, and give you lots of examples of it. But um, if you pick something you think, yeah, I'd quite like to do that, that's a brilliant start. So certainly aim to pick something that you as a team think, yeah, that would be fun, we would want to do it. The second uh, piece of advice is to pick something that is simple. Generally, uh, it's true for a, a lot of people who are, 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 are learning software engineering, becoming developers, you tend to underestimate, and in fact this is true for a lot of people who've been developers for, for decades, it's very easy to underestimate the amount of time and effort that uh, an activity will, will take. You might think, okay, I need to do this and this and that, it'll probably take me a day to do that. But then other things get in the way, you, you know, there's little bugs or errors or other events that get in place and it ends up taking you two days. So I would suggest for the project that you're going to develop within the module, stick to something that you feel is simple. Something that you think, you know, yeah, we, we could easily implement that within the time. It is invariably a safe thing to say, okay, you know, is, is, is this too simple? Do I, do I think, uh, you know, am I not doing enough? If you're anyway concerned, just simply talk to me. But it's true for the vast, vast majority of projects that if it is a simple idea, that's about the right size to implement within the time that we have available. It is extremely uh, rare to have um, a complex, multifaceted game that maybe involves lots of different systems um, ending up being implemented within the time that we have available to us. So something simple. And the final piece of advice is plan to develop a demo. So think about this not in terms of developing a full feature-packed game, but rather view it along the lines of, okay, if you want to produce a demo that sort of flavors and gives you an indication of what the full game would be like. Um, so certainly do not plan to develop something that will take hours to play through. Rather, ask yourself, okay, I want to develop something that maybe takes 10 minutes to sort of experience it in its entirety. So it's more of a, an illustration of what you're capable of. 
So for your project, pick something you find fun, something that you feel is simple, and sort of view it as a demo, not the full game. And if you adhere to those sort of three simple pieces of advice, then um, you, you in all likelihood will have a, a project that um, you've got a good chance of getting completed within the time that we have available. Contingency planning is going to be key to the project uh, because things will not go entirely to plan. Uh, they, they, they very, very rarely do. And one of the lectures that we will have quite uh, soon, or is quite early within the course, looks at uh, agile and lean forms of software development. And, and they're explicitly set up to, to deal with uncertainty and changing requirements. And we're going to use those approaches to, to help us mitigate um, the, the risk that we don't um, realize or deliver upon the type of game that we, we want to develop. And you'll see this as well in terms of the hand-ins, because I'm always going to get you to try to think about your, your functionality and your features in terms of those that are core, that are really needed, and those which are desirable or, or optional, things that don't have a major impact if they're not in. Certainly, I'd also recommend as well, look at the assessment criteria. Not only look at it, read it, think about it. This, or the assessment criteria defines the areas of assessment that your project, when you submit it in, will be measured against. And also sets out you know, what you need to achieve if you want to get a first or a, a two one or a two two in, in the different categories. So definitely have a um, a good explore of that because it'll it, it'll act as a guide um, by way of understanding what type of mark your your project is likely to attract. The project is team based, and whilst it's certainly possible that um, you could develop your own Android game yourself. If you're developing in a, a small team, it is going to make the process a lot more manageable, a lot more straightforward. So we're going to be using um, teams of four to five students as a as, as an average size. And this this maps on well because whenever you're going out to working in your, your year in industry, um, you will be within a team-based environment. If need be, I'll, I'll act as a, as a brokering service by way of getting teams formed. Um, Really said, I mean, it's going to make it more manageable, uh, but working within a team, whilst it does enable greater, more sophisticated projects to be tackled, it's, it's not necessarily a free cost to that. Um, time and effort needs to be put in by all of the members of the team in terms of coordinating the activities within the team, in terms of integrating your different efforts, uh, and alongside all team members being flexible and showing flexibility to, to their other team members. There will be um, a, an overall mark awarded to the, the project, um, but by way of looking at how each person has contributed uh, to the project, uh, that will be used to, to drive your, your individual mark uh, within the, the module. Now, this bit might scare quite a few people on the module. This module, it doesn't have any practicals. So it is quite different from first year modules where you would attend your, your weekly practical and there would be um, demonstrators and, and, and uh, you know, teaching associates there to, to help direct and shape and you'd be following a, a set of guided instructions in, in, in terms of whatever the module is about. We don't have any practicals in this module, um, but you will need to learn Android. You will need to pick up a number of games programming techniques, and it's your responsibility to do this. I'm going to give you lots and lots of uh, hopefully useful uh, pieces of information and useful links, but it's going to be up to you to investigate uh, that material. It's also going to be up to you to set aside uh, the time that you need to do that and also to set aside the time that you will need then to to develop the project and to have team meetings and integration meetings and debugging meetings and all of those different types of things. Um, so it's very much in your corporate way of setting aside the time to do that. And, and a significant amount of time will need to be set aside because it isn't a, an easy undertaking. There's two very good reasons why 
I do this, why I don't have um, a series of practicals in the module that week by week slowly build up, uh, for example, an Android game. First, the reasons are um, picking up things yourself, learning new technologies, learning new languages, finding out, investigating and, and scheduling your time. That's what actual programmers do. And uh, I keep mentioning about the placement year because, I mean, it, it is at the end of your second year. And when you go out in placement, you will find yourself in a situation where you will be required to pick up new languages, new technologies to learn about whatever project you're working on. And the assumption is this is something that you will manage yourself under your own steam. Um, so this is a good opportunity to, to practice it, to get some practice uh, before you go out into the, uh, to, to work for whatever employer uh, you select it. The second reason is that uh, whilst uh, basically all of the first year modules have practicals, it is very rare for a third or a fourth year module to have practicals. So in this regard, second year is a little bit of a, a transitional year uh, where the, the use of practicals phases out. And, and there's, there's a design reason behind this. Higher education, one of its fundamental aims across all disciplines is to produce graduates that are independent learners that that can manage and can control their own learning they don't need somebody to, to hold their hand rather they can they can decide i'm going to learn about this and they can then get the materials and, and manage their own learning and this isn't the type of thing that you you know you suddenly get to third year and think okay i better start doing it now rather it is um, a skill that is developed over time so this gives you a bit of opportunity to to develop that skill so by way of redress, and uh, this acts somewhat of as, as a counterbalance to the, the fact that there are no practicals. I'm, I'm aware of that fact because I'm, I'm the one who didn't put them in. I'm aware that you have a more significant learning challenge within the module that you're going to have to pick up and learn Android yourself and learn games programming yourself. Uh, and there isn't a series of practicals to, to, if you like, notionally hold your hand. Uh, so the projects you submit at the end, when I'm marking them, I will take this into account. I, I know that everybody was presented with quite a difficult challenge. If I had to put in a whole series of practicals, it would mean that when I was marking uh, your submissions at the end, I would be more demanding because I knew that everybody was able to benefit from that. So in that sense, it, it, it balances out. The, the final mark that you receive at the end will not be compromised um, but by but not having practicals. It does mean that your time during the module will be a little bit more demanding um, but as a counterbalance to that whenever you go out in your placement year because you have had uh, more experience of picking up independent languages and independent learning it'll make your placement year that little bit easier. So next up is the project timeline. We'll have a little look at um, how we will take the, the semester and a half that's available to us and to chop it up into different project related chunks. So here we can see the first 12 weeks of semester one and the first two weeks are going to be all about getting the, the teams formed and uh, once formed getting your ideas for the type of game that you want to develop um, pulling them together. Now from weeks three up to week six, we're going to have a four week sprint. Now the, the sprint is, is we're going to use a, an agile development methodology and we will separate out our, our development time into a number of different sprints. And within each sprint, you will have, or you will set yourself a number of goals for what you want to be able to show running, working at the end of that sprint. Now th the first one, um, is, is going to be a little bit different because in the first sprint it's going to be closely tied into the if you like the content that's been explored within the lectures and it's going to be looking at, at developing the the fundamentals that all games have so things in terms of input or graphics or sound um, so it'll be rather rather sort of controlled now a little bit into the the first sprint at the end of week three I'm going to ask each of the teams to submit in details of, um, of, of the team and also the game that you are proposing to, to develop. And I'll give you some feedback on that then. 
um, feedback. I'll, I'll cover things like you know the, the complexity of it, uh, how much time it's likely to take, how well it maps onto the marketing scheme, uh, th those types of aspects. Um, in weeks seven to nine, we have the, the second sprint. And this will differ quite a lot from the first sprint. In the second sprint, I'm going to get you to set your own goals. And what you will be trying to achieve in the second sprint is to, if you like, to, to realize what I'm calling here the game architecture. So it's, it's the underlying essence, the framework on top of which your game can be created. And it, it'll build upon all of the basic um, input handling graphics and signs that we'll do within the first sprint. But therein, you're starting to, to piece them together in some way that's appropriate for the, the game that you want to create. The end of week nine, uh, you will, um, so that's the end of the second sprint, you will be submitting in um, details of the architecture that you have developed. And I'll, I'll go through all of the submissions. I'll give you feedback in terms of the, the quality of the coding that you've created, how your architecture looks, how is it it's shaping up. And it's going to be quite important, and you'll see this when we look at the Agile uh, talk, that at the end of each sprint, it is a runnable snapshot. We have something that can run that works. Bringing us up to the end of the first semester, we have the third sprint. And your, your goal in the third sprint is to take your, your architecture, if you like, the foundations of the game, and then to add on sufficient functionality to, to bring to life a, a very simple, the most simple, crudely playable version of the game that you, you, know, you, you can manage. It's not a polished game at this point, um, but at the end of week 12, we should have something that is playable and you know, it, it, it should look roughly like the type of game that you want to, to create. And that'll bring us up to, to Christmas time, so the end of the first semester. Over the, the semester break, um, okay, you'll have your exams for the other modules and there'll be an opportunity there really just to, to do any sort of tidying up, if you like, in terms of the game. But I'm not going to set any uh, explicit sprint um, over the, the Christmas or the examination period. Going into the second semester then, so whenever you come back, um, there'll be an opportunity to submit in another progress update. So this, this could be what you, you know, have achieved at the end of week 12 in the first semester and whatever opportunity you've had to, to tweak it, to refine um, over the semester break. So it's a runnable snapshot of your program. Um, I'll give you some feedback on how it's shaping up. You'll be able to ask for feedback in whatever areas that you're, you're looking for. Now, start of second semester, we're into the last two sprints. So the first of those last two sprints, which is actually the fourth sprint we've undertaken, is in the first three weeks. And if you recall, at the end of week 12, we've managed to develop a, a sort of a crudely playable version of your game, and that's your target. The first sprint of the second semester is where you refine that. You add in the more complex pieces of functionality. You, you add in the wow factor, so to speak. End of week three, you will be submitting in another update of your, your progress. Again, a runnable snapshot of your, your project. I'll have a look at that. I'll give you some feedback. Again, you can ask me some questions on it. And from weeks four to six, we're into our final sprint. This is the fifth sprint. And therein you'll be adding in whatever finishing touches, whatever optional pieces of functionality, whatever refinements you want to add in um, for your game up to the point of submission. So submission will happen at the start of week seven. And you will be submitting in a um, couple of things. One's the actual game that you've developed on. Rather, we're going to be using um, Subversion. So we'll be pulling off a snapshot uh, from Subversion of your completed game. And there's also a little bit of documentation where I want you to, to give me the agreed uh, team contribution. So I'm going to ask the, the team, and you, you'll, you'll see this when we look at the project documentation, to, to agree what each person has done. It's going to be largely a, a, a factual uh, account, and that will be used to help um, to determine individual marks uh, within the assessment. Post submission at the end, there's um, three things that uh, will happen. Uh, first one is that we will um, assess the project that you submit in and uh, a mark will be awarded um, to the project and also based on the contributions of each individual, an individual mark awarded uh, to each individual therefrom. 
Sometimes um, we need to do VIVA. Now, a VIVA is, is basically an oral examination. It's something that actually PhD students do. Um, if you're in a situation where you're borderline, and I can't describe, uh, decide if this is first class or 2-1, I'll invite in the whole team. Or if we're in a situation where the team isn't able to agree a contribution, again, we'll invite in the whole team. Or if I'm a little bit... Mm, I'm not convinced that what has been developed is full of your own work. I'll invite in the whole team. And we'll, we'll do a code walkthroughs, we'll have a discussion, we'll have a look at the code. It's, if you like, it's a, it's a bit of an exploration of who's done what. And it gives us a very capable way of, of, of deciding, um, should it be a, a first or two one, of deciding who did what within the project and of, of verifying the authenticity of what has been submitted. Uh, not all teams get to be called in. It, it just depends how the project has has gone. Um, depending upon the, the the other events we have on in the semester, just to flag up that we may well be going for a, a bit of an expo with this here, where you'll have an opportunity to to demonstrate your your project to other students um, or, or to employers who who come in who want to have a little work at a little look at the work that you have um, done. That'll occur over week seven, the demo may be a little bit after it, and that, that's really where this module then concludes. So we'll be done by week eight, uh, which means the remaining four weeks in the second semester, we're not going to get in the way of any of your other large project mess modules yeah, in that second semester. So how are we going to assess all of this? Uh, how are we going to take what it is you submit in at the end and give the project and each individual within the team um, a, a mark? So let's have a look at that. Each project's going to be marked out of 100, reasonable, and there's going to be a number of different categories that we will consider and, and look at by way of, of forming that mark. And you can see the categories here. Uh, professionalism, the quality of the architectural design, um, your use of input, graphics or sound in terms of the algorithmic aspects. How many different game features you have within it, the, the complexity of the algorithms that you're using within your game, and the style that you use for your coding, and the overall code quality. Now, there's an assessment document we'll talk about in a little bit. It'll give you the in-depth breakdown of, of each of those, and that's what you'll want to, to have a, a look at. In terms of those different areas of assessment, you, as, as in the team, will actually have some control over how they are weighted. And, and the reason for this is that as a team, you have the flexibility to create the type of game that you want to create. So some people may, for example, go for a, a puzzle game. Some may go for a, a platformer. Uh, some may go for something completely different. And there's a, there'll be a different imbalance then in terms of the importance of graphics or sound within the game. A difference in balance in terms of the amount of game features you could put in or just how complex the algorithms are so you know for example if, if you did a, a chess game um, graphics and sound probably not that significant game features well you could have quite a wide range of game features but certainly there'll be a number of complex algorithms um, whereas if you're doing a, a sort of a shooter game then you might have a lot of nice graphical and sound effects so so games differ in terms of um, if you like, the, their area of emphasis. And what that means is that out of the 100 marks that are assigned to the project, you get to control how 50 of those marks will be allocated. So in particular, for the use of um, inputs, graphics or sound, for the extent of the game features, for the complexity of the game algorithms, you can determine the weighting that is applied to those different categories. Um, from a minimum of five up to a maximum of 25 in those categories. And it gives you a bit of a chance to, 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 to fine tune the marking scheme um, to it. The other ones, the professionalism, the quality of the architectural design and the coding style and code quality, I mean, th these are things that apply across all uh, forms of development. So they have fixed uh, marks, they're not subject um, to, to change. So code reuse. I'm not a fan of reinventing the wheel. Uh, and, and to be honest, I think few programmers are. There are literally, there, there are communities of thousands of programmers out there, and be the Android or Java or C++ based. And, and there's a rich 
um, set of resources. Uh, that's one of the benefits of the community. That if you're problems, you can publish this and people show examples of algorithms and, and examples of, of nice ways of doing things. Now, if you want, you can make use of any of those existing algorithms or, or, or make use of code fragments, either because they provide the functionality that you want or you want to take it and to modify and to extend it. Or you can use third-party classes, third-party libraries. If you think your game would benefit, for example, from having a physics engine, you don't need to write your own. In fact, you'd be advised not to write your own within the context of this module. Um, but you are certainly free to, to take an off-the-shelf third-party physics engine and to integrate it within um, your game. So, so again, it's, it's part and parcel of normal software development. You ask, okay, what do I want to achieve and, and what existing solutions or you know, software is out there that helps me achieve that. Um, again, you need to be careful over licensing and using the, 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 the code and the, the software in an appropriate uh, and justified way. But if I'm going to let you do this, then I need to have some way of, of understanding uh, when you submit your project at the end, what is 100% your code? What is 100% somebody else's code? And what is a bit of a mixture of both where you've taken something and extended and modified it? So here's how we do that. We're going to use um, software versioning. So SSVN is a way of uh, enabling you and a team to develop your project. And it's of immense use to the team because it gives you a way of actually sharing your changes together. Um, it gives you an automatic backup. You can revert back to previous versions if you put in a bug that you can't find. Um, from my point of view, it enables me to get a, uh, various tools you can use in SVN to, to get a sort of a snapshot of how the project developed over time. But who did what? Who added things in? You know, did it slowly change? Did it, you know, was there, was there peaks or were large pieces of software came into it and so on? So I'll be using um, versioning by way of understanding how it is your project has uh, developed. At the end, um, all of the, the projects that are, are sub are, uh, yeah, they're, they're introduced into an online plagiarism test. And invariably, you, you get clashes coming up in terms of this piece of code matches this piece of code here. Um, not an issue, as long as you have provided me with a reference. So I understand that, look, okay, here's a third party piece of code, and you give me the reference to it, um, and maybe you've explained how you've modified or changed it. That's fine. As long as you do that, you're perfectly safe. Um, I suggest you have a look at the module handbook because it talks in more detail about how you can safely reference uh, other sources of code that you have used. And as mentioned, we, we've got vivas at the end and if there is any question over the authenticity of the code, then we'll untangle this within um, a viva. So come and do your bit. Um, your project needs you, it really does. Uh, and the reason we have a slide on this is that um, out of the, say, the 60 teams that we will have in the module, each year, um, or at least the last number of previous years, there's always been a small number of teams where you have an individual or a couple of individuals that don't really pull their weight. And um, they, they sort of settle into a, a comfortable position where other people uh, provide all of the contribution to the module and they maybe help a little bit here or, or there and they, they sort of hope at the end that uh, you know because the project is marked that'll be enough to pull them through. For this module it won't be and it's important that I flag this up at the very very start of it. So whilst it is a group based project, whilst you are collaborating and developing a game, everybody gets an individual mark at the end. And that individual mark is, if you like, your starter for 10 is the quality of the project that is developed by the team. So that's assessed first of all, and that sort of indicates, you know, is, is as a team, have you developed a first class piece of work or a 2 1 piece uh, class of work? However, the mark that each individual receives is based on how they have contributed. To that particular project and if you have a look at the, the the final assessment document you'll see the types of information that we use to to determine that um, it'll be in part based on what the team thinks of your royal contribution it'll also be part in fact more more this latter one than the former it'll be based on the code that is directly attributable to the individual so if there is a first class project that's submitted in at the end 
and the team says everybody played a wonderful role but whenever I look at the subversion I find that here we have an individual who has done very little has submitted very little code to it uh, that individual will not be passing the module um, it is an individual mark it is important that everybody plays their part uh, within the project and, and doesn't sort of ride on the, the coattails of the, the rest of the team by way of, of being dragged along and being carried along because it it, it, it simply will not be a, a, a viable way of passing uh, this particular module. So we've had a I suppose a, a bit of a, a summary or an overview of the assessment um, uh, that that will be used to determine a mark for each project. The The full story is um, set out within two different documents. One's the project assessment criteria document. It's, if you like, the, the techie one for each of the different areas of assessment. So, for example, the, the quality of the code itself. It will define what that means in more detail and will then also define what it takes to get a first, a two, one, a two, two, a, a third, and so on. So th that gives you, if you like, the gory detail. Um, and you most certainly should read that and become comfortable and familiar with it. The project submission report is what the teams will be uh, submitting in in the very end of the project. So if you have a bit of a look at that now, you, you, you'll see the types of information that each team is going to be asked to provide. It's worthwhile reading it at the start because you will then understand um, how each team member is expected to contribute and the types of things that will be looked for from each team member. So definitely do have um, a good in-depth read of both of those uh, different documents. By way of a, a summary of this particular talk, just to reiterate that this whole module is, is about the project. The project is by far the most important thing and it, it's really what for all of us should be the, 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 the focal point of, of all of the efforts and all of our attention that we put um, into the module. In terms of the project and the type of thing that you might like to develop, the best piece of advice I can offer you is to develop a simple and fun demo. Something that's fun, something that you want to develop, something that you feel is simple, it's not big and complex. And it's a demo. It sort of illustrates in five to ten minutes all of the features that it has. It's not a, a three-hour long um, experience. And finally, even though we are at the start of the module, even though assessment is months away, in a very real sense, all of the activities that you do from week two, week three, week four are contributing to your final mark. So be sure to read the assessment criteria document. Be sure to read the project submission document as this will set out at the end how the time that you've spent against this module will be assessed. So it's very much in your interest to understand up front uh, what represents, um, if you like, high value activities on the module.